Welcome everyone. Uh, now today I'm uh, doing my new video on the second part of the Alan bailout series, trying something different for the starters today. And today we're going to talk about the Lufthansa group and I'm going to make an introduction here. Um, with Lufthansa being of course the major airline here um, as the name goes, Lufthansa Group, and not only Lufthansa is inside, but also Swiss International Airlines um, since the mid-2000s, uh, first decade of the 2000s. Then we have Austrian Airlines, as well as Brussels Airlines. I'm sh I know that there's also Eurowings inside, but uh, for today, not I'm not going to talk about this one. So, uh, once we have arrived to the first board, um, so you will see here the four main airlines of uh, the Lufthansa Group, uh, Lufthansa, Swiss, Austrian and Brussels Airlines. Um, as I mentioned before, for this video I will not talk much about Eurowings, but um, just as it's the smallest one of all, all, all the member airlines, but uh, you can rest assured that um, uh, they are uh, undergoing similar, if not the same, kind of measures. And uh, at the same time, it's also true that uh, there are the least news coming out of the Eurowings case as well. So uh, maybe in a future news video, uh, I will refer to Eurowings as well. So without further ado, uh, Lufthansa is up top. Not, and I want to make it clear, not because of any type of um, any sort of uh, feelings from my side towards Lufthansa in a good or, or, or bad way, but just as you will see here in the um, in the numbers, they are by far the biggest of those four airlines uh, in terms of the employees as well as in terms, therefore, of the. So of the sheer size and also then of the sheer size of the bailout etc itself. So you will see here that uh, the bailout that uh, has been all but agreed with the German government is of uh, 9 billion euros uh, and the actual size of before the pandemic was of 138,000 employees. Uh, and that I have to say is, of course, uh, not only, I guess, from, from Lufthansa itself, from the airline, but also uh, from the different other Lufthansa subsidies uh, that are directly, that are not airlines, but are technical services, etc. But still, it's a huge number. And as you will see, then with Swiss, uh, when we take a look on that, uh, they were actually the first airline of those four uh, to have a bailout agreed with their government uh, worth of 1.78 billion euros um, and out of the, out of that 1.78 1.19 billion euros was directly attributed to the airline uh, and the rest for different services as for uh, ground services, catering, technical um, subsidies, etc. Um, and 85% of that uh, low of that money is uh, uh, by loan uh, to different banks in, in Switzerland. And they are, again, all the numbers are pre-COVID, uh, around 9,000 employees strong. Uh, and that, as you see here, it's the only really done deal um, in that in in that group uh, and with these airlines. Then we have Austrian airlines, who, if I go further down, have are a little smaller in terms of employees, seven thousand around seven thousand employees, and they have originally actually asked for a um, uh, for a uh, considerably bigger. Um, uh, bailout than they have uh, so far got. They have got 300 million 
uh, euros uh, from the government uh, guaranteed as loans by different banks um, and for a time period of six years. Why six years is quite important, you will see in the next board. Um, and I put down here that it's only half done because that's the first part. At least 367, if not more, even if I'm not mistaken, it might be even 467 more. They were asking for around 700 million euros originally from the government. Uh, so now they are still even that first 300 million part is a done deal. Uh, the rest that they will most probably still need uh, is still in negotiations with their government. Um, and at the same time, uh, Brussels Airlines, uh, that's not a done deal at all. There are still a lot of negotiations going on and they were virtually asking for almost the same as Austrian Airlines has now got, about 290 million euros from their government with 4,000 employees uh, in total uh, before COVID, of whom across the bank and also in Brussels Airlines, uh, a lot of them are already on temporary unemployment or highly reduced uh, schedules in any way as of the last weeks where no planes were flying. Um, and that's really still a negotiation. And the main, apart from from, from Swiss, uh, but especially with Austrian and Brussels, actually the um, negotiations were between Lufthansa and their governments, as well as Lufthansa with the German government. Um, therefore, I have started with those three smaller airlines compared to Lufthansa as part of the Lufthansa group. But uh, I will now in the next board um, deal with Lufthansa as an airline and as the re main representative of the Lufthansa group because their case is not only the biggest and but also the most important for the three other airlines, especially for Austrian and Brussels as the Swiss deal is already done, but especially for Austrian and Brussels. The Lufthansa deal with the government was, is ma of major importance in order to see um, how much is needed from the respective Austrian and Belgian governments and how um, this, uh, the, the respective bailouts could be used within the Lufthansa group. Um, so, and there you will see in the next board why, but um, I have just written down here the EU as a question mark. Because um, if you remember the last, the first bailout video that I that I did on the U.S. Uh, there in the American market, of course, um, there was the government on one side, the airlines on the other side, and then there was the there were the regulators of the U.S. That's true, um, but in the European Union, as all these countries apart from the Swiss, of course, are members of the European Union. Uh, every such deal has to be accepted uh, also and validated by the European Union and especially by the European Union Commission uh, as the main regulator for this, uh, for this geographical and political area. So without further ado, therefore, I will change this board and then uh, we will discuss the main chunk of the bailout for the Lufthansa Group for Lufthansa itself in the next month. So the agreements that were reached with Lufthansa. Um, first, uh, you have to say, of course, Lufthansa had uh, tried to reach an agreement first with the German government, which is, I guess, all logical. At the same time, they were also negotiating with Brussels Airlines. They were negotiating with, well, with Brussels Airlines and basically with the Belgian government. Uh, as well as with the Austrian government. But uh, those negotiations have not yet uh, come to a full conclusion because the big one has not neither. So what is the big one about? So 9 billion euros, as was mentioned before. Uh, and it was pretty clear at the beginning, from the beginning, that uh, the German government had the clear position that they cannot uh, that, that they cannot let Lufthansa um, get uh, bankrupt, that uh, they cannot let the worst case scenario happen. Um, and so for it was pretty clear from the, from the get-go 
that Lufthansa would get the money in some way or shape or form, but the question was how. And the uh, government uh, was clearly targeting more uh, as concession as concessions. They were targeting more uh, rights to uh, basically have a say uh, in Lufthansa. Uh, and one of the major concessions was that they would get 20 to 25 plus one percent stake of the airline. Now, what does 20 uh, until 25 plus one percent mean? Uh, 25, 20 percent uh, will would be part of the agreement as such. But in case there was going to be a uh, an attempt by another airline uh, to take over. Uh, Lufthansa and Lufthansa Group, uh, then in that case, uh, the German government could acquire the 5 plus 1 percent of stakes that were still needed then on top of the 20 percent in order to vote against and to um, to, to prevent any takeover from, from taking place. Uh, and in order to ensure that, they were also uh, guaranteed a seat uh, in the supervisory board of Lufthansa. Um, so that's why that's, those were the two main concessions that the government um, got, that they wanted and they got in the end. Um, also, of course, always taking into account that one of the main uh, goals for them was to not only keep Lufthansa alive, but also to keep as many jobs um, afloat as possible. And actually, up until the day of today, uh, no uh, clear messages was yet sent from Lufthansa about laying people off or, or otherwise. Um, again, schemes of uh, partial part-time working, of reducing hours, etc., that are common, unfortunately, among, along, among the, um, the airline industry were also not uncommon for Lufthansa, but no, no furloughs, no, no, no sackings um, of uh, employees. But then uh, this deal had to be still up, agreed by the uh, EU Commission uh, on, on, on trade. Uh, and there the commissioner made an incision and said, well, uh, Lufthansa would have to give up a, up to 72 slots in, it, in its main two airport hubs in Frankfurt and Munich. Now, what are slots? Just to give you a quick crash course, um, slots are slots to take off and to land. So every airline that, uh, that flies somewhere, um, one flight has to have a takeoff and a landing slot. And those slots are always slots in that same airport. Uh, for example, if uh, Lufthansa would fly an airplane from Frankfurt to, let's say, New York, uh, it would have to buy such slots, a landing slot, because it would have to come from somewhere. Uh, and then uh, it would take uh, take the it would be cleaned. It would be prepared. It would take passengers, and then it would have also Lufthansa. It would have to purchase a takeoff slot then to fly to New York. So those uh, slots cost money, uh, and uh, Lufthansa has the vast majority of those uh, slots available in its main airport hubs in Frankfurt and Munich bought already. Uh, so they have, as it's their hubs, they have a, a majority of, of slots, but uh, the commission said, that because it viewed rather negatively uh, already in a regular circumstance, but even after um, after yeah being a bit more lenient in COVID times, still they they didn't view it as a positive that uh, an airline would be bailed out by a government and the government would increase the stakes as uh, according to its views uh, it would then distort some um, of the competition in the skies and in those airports um, where they are, have their hubs uh, and where they are strong anyways already. So then they said, no, uh, slots are very, very valuable. Slots are a, a kind of mm, different currency in a way uh, to uh, negotiate about. about. And then um, the boards, in unison, the boards of 
the board of the Lufthansa Group, the German government, uh, Angela Merkel made it uh, something, uh, an important thing for her to, to be adamant that they would not agree. And one of the major issues also that even trade unions, not only German trade unions from Lufthansa, but also Belgian, Austrian trade unions, trade unions from the different countries of the different airlines of the Lufthansa Group said, is that if you would give up those slots, then uh, you would also encourage uh, those uh, slots being taken up by uh, low-cost areas, uh, uh, carriers who, in the view also of the trade unions, of course, uh, rightfully, in my opinion, um, would not be that that would should not be the the kind of competition that the EU Commission would want uh, to have, as those are mostly the airlines who. Uh, act on who who do social dumping, who have uh, really uh, far worse contracts than the uh, legacy carriers, as they are called, the bigger carriers have. So they were clearly against it. In the end, they had to compromise, and in the end, uh, they have to give up slots, but 24 in Frankfurt and Munich, so 12 per airport, and that makes uh, two per flight so that's six flights any given uh, day so with all the dozens of flights that they have uh, each day from there uh, even when when uh, the um, traffic will slowly to pick up that's kind of the last resort that they had to agree and in the end it, indeed it is not um, it is not that uh, harsh as the three times higher uh, 72 slots originally asked by the Commission. And now I will change the board one last time and let's see how I view this this agreement that has not yet been signed but uh, all signs um, um, seem that that will be the final agreement, how I think uh, this agreement fares. And so the last board um, I decided this time to go with a bit of a pro and con uh, board here, uh, differently than I did in the last video of uh, the US case. And yes, of course, you can uh, make it easy and go to the end and say, well, it's a 50-50 case, in my opinion, but let me explain that a bit. Um, on one hand, you see why um, airlines, uh, alliances of airlines sorry, are, are important. Um, you see that um, in order to save jobs, um, those airlines, alliances um, can indeed uh, do something. Uh, on the other hand, I also think that you also see it depends on the alliance and maybe in one of the future videos I might uh, make a more basic video on explaining uh, the pros and cons of alliances as such, not only Star Alliance, alliance of different airlines uh, globally, but also alliances like the Lufthansa Group and others. Uh, but on the other hand, it's true that it depends on the alliance itself. And it you can see that, especially in the case of Brussels Airlines, where uh, any day now um, the airline will not have money to sustain its daily business, um, the uh, bailouts that could have already been decided by the Brussels, by the government in Brussels, by the Belgian government, could not have gone through yet because the Belgian government uh, naturally wanted guarantees from Lufthansa that they would uh, use those uh, that money, those 290 million euros, um, solely for Brussels Airlines and not for the Lufthansa Group and uh, Lufthansa could not sign that uh, until they did not know how much and if they would get the bailout money from the German government. So in this case, this dependency on these relations and especially in the case of the Lufthansa Group, having dependencies of such uh, unequally strong airline partners can create difficulties uh, for sure. Um, now with regards to jobs, it's a bit like in general, a bit of a 50-50 question, because for now um, there have been some some 
media and articles and some some airlines saying there might be job loss, which I guess again probably will be an inevitable in the long run. Uh, but um, at least Lufthansa has not made um, clear remarks on that yet. Um, but for now, until now, at least differently than with many other airlines, uh, there has not been a large scale of job loss, which is sure to be permanent. Let's put it in this way. So no complete and utter job loss in a large scale. On the other hand, what we can say also as a con at the same time is that in all those negotiations, apart from the politics and airlines saying that they were doing all that and all those negotiations and all those talks in order to lose as uh, few jobs as absolutely necessary, there were no clear, um, there's no clarity in how, what does that mean is exactly. So um, we will only see what that really means once the deal is really agreed, once the money is flowing, and then we can understand whether it's going more towards this or towards uh, that way. And finally, I would also say those have those two in this sense have nothing to do with each other, but a positive thing in terms of the uh, slots that Lufthansa Group has to has to give up. It's true, as I said before, they are not as far reaching as the original commission proposal, but I think indeed it's better than nothing. And it's not too bad in, in, in that sense to have also some competition uh, in there. Uh, on the other hand, it's true also that um, the uh, originally the 72 slots that were originally proposed by the commission were without strings attached. Uh, they could be given to anyone. And finally, the 24 slots that were agreed, they can only be given in, at least in the first 18 months uh, uh, from the as per the agreement, uh, from when the agreement starts, to those carriers who have not been active with routes from Frankfurt and or Munich. So uh, these fears of uh, all the low-cost airlines, EasyJet, Ryanair, with their um, being able to do that then, and those first 18 months, for example, uh, Ryanair is already operating from Frankfurt, so will not be able to do that. EasyJet is already operating from Munich, so will not be able to take advantage of that, at least in the first time. There, on the opposite, it's they could, Ryanair could uh, start to operate from Munich and EasyJet could from, from Frankfurt as well as Wizz Air, I think, from both. Uh, but at least it's not such a large scale and clear uh, cut thing uh, compared to if that was not in place. And finally, apart from, from what I could see at least, apart from some, um, some discussions in Austria with the Austrian Greens and in, 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 uh, in, in, in the, from the political side, um, there has not really been any further discussions on tying those bailouts with some ecological advancements and making uh, flight travels more sustainable uh, and more eco-friendly. Um, I already mentioned it in with the US example that, of course, while um, while um, kerosene and um, uh, making the paying for kerosene and and making our airplanes and air travel more eco efficient uh, is at the same time also cost efficient in a lot of ways so while for example airlines are reduced actively reducing now their their uh, planes uh, and uh, scrapping especially older planes who are not so fuel efficient with newer planes that are is already in itself an improvement but apart from that there are many more for example, you could um, uh, invest much more in, in research of uh, synthetic fuel, of more eco-friendly fuel, uh, which, again, in Austria, uh, I have read and heard that that was part of the discussion, but not of the deal in the end. But apart from that, not really lots of... Uh, um, lots of discussion on that topic, which is something that, on one hand, it's true when it would... Uh, take money to to additional money to to uh, fund in a time where absolutely no money is there uh, I can understand on one hand that that's kind of 
a tricky uh, equation, but on the other hand, uh, it could be also an opportunity. So if that's not at all inside, that's a bit of a miss. So voila, I would say it's a bit of a 50-50 thing. Uh, I would say it's a bit better still than what has been done in the US comparatively, but also better and but also and also maybe better to some others. But there's for sure some leeway to be done. So with that being said. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked it. If you did, uh, it would make my day if you'd uh, like, subscribe, push the notification button, uh, all of the above, whatever you like. Uh, stay in touch and see you for the next video. Bye bye.